Hey, so it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvelously well. I'm here with the very wonderful Larry Crane. For those of you who don't know, Larry, for the last 20 years, you're on your 20th anniversary, aren't you? Uh, next, uh, in April. 20 April. years of tape hop. 20 yeah. years in April, it will be 20 years of tape hop, which probably is unofficially every single engineer and producer's favorite magazine. I hope so. We I think try. so. <laughs> well, you, you know, it's just like, you know, you go into any studio in America and, and England as well, obviously. And it's just because it's a little bit more gritty and grimy and, you know, you're talking like, what do you really think of that? Well, everybody yeah. says it's good, but it actually sucks. You know, it's <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, this I wasn't a professional when I started this. I wasn't a professional recording person. Right. Yeah. And and I started this just for myself to learn more. And so that that's, that's fantastic. Probably carries through. Right. You know. Yeah. It's that sort of honesty. And. I, I, a good friend of mine, uh, Jack uh, Jack Douglas, when I interviewed him, he said, what are you calling your company? And I said, well, we're calling the YouTube channel Produce Like a Pro. And he started laughing and he goes, growing up in New York with like him and all these ridiculous guys like Jimmy Iovine and yeah. Roy Sakala. You know, Roy Sakala was a genius engineer mm -hmm. that nobody, even outside of us, probably even knows. Right. Guys are genius. And he goes, we used to joke about professionals. Professionals were the guys that wore the suits <laughs> you know, and, and we're in the Tonight Show band in 1950 or whatever it was, you know. Sure. And so I, I get it, you know. I, I didn't go to school for this stuff. I didn't. I had no idea what I was doing. I just started doing it. <laughs> oh, same here. I mean, I just, you know, I mean, I, that was the reason that Tape Hop started was I wanted to learn. And I thought, you know, you can really wear out your welcome if you keep bugging other engineers and asking questions about, <laughs> you know, you're not paying them to record with them, but you're asking where to put a 57 on a snare. Right? <laughs> yeah. So if you interview them and put them in your little magazine and then they want to talk to you. Damn, you just figured out my whole business model. <laughs> <laughs> Better than school. <laughs> you know, I just did, I just did Val Garay and yes. uh, he showed me, Two mics that he's used is one he uses on acoustic. That he's used on everything, all the James Taylor albums, and then another one he uses on electric guitars. They're, they're both like fifty dollar microphones oh, that, man. that will suddenly become three hundred dollars when they realize the James Taylor sound. In fact, I yeah. could probably say it. it's the Sony. <laughs> it's the Sony. I think it's called an ECB fifty. It's just that little electret condenser. I've and got he, one. You've got it, and he clips yeah. it on the sound hole, and mm -hmm. he points it up towards the hand. Yeah. And that's the sound of James Taylor's acoustic guitar playing yeah. <laughs> on all of, up. all of those great albums. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, I've done that. Put a little piece of duct tape or something on the sound hole so it doesn't, doesn't tear into it. You're already you know? ahead of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we wrote a review of one over 10 years ago, probably. Wow. I think, I think, uh, I can't, maybe John Bocciagalupi, my partner with right. Tape Op, he might have written that. And uh, he told me go buy one, you know, and they were fifty bucks on eBay or Still something. Still fifty bucks. I've got. I'm yeah. bidding. I'm bidding on one at the moment after Good talking deal. to him. Yeah. <laughs> oh and, yeah. And the other one, well, uh, is the uh, Shaw SM fifty three. Fifty three. Yeah, it's like they made it in the sixties, and it's it's mm. silver looking and looks very sixties, and that's right. what you that's what he uses on every electric guitar. And, and I'm bidding on one at the moment. It's at 60 bucks. <laughs> All right. Yeah, don't get too crazy. <laughs> well, hmm, I guess I'm wasting my money. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, so 20 years ago, you, you, what, you were in a band. You were the guy that recorded all your own music in the band. You were the demo I was, guy. At that point, actually, the band had broken up. But I had been in this band, Vomit Launch, for, uh, from 85 to 92. What a name. And we did. We did four albums. Uh, we even had a, a P and D deal with Rough Trade, you know, for the oh, wow. uh, records, and did sold quite a few and toured and stuff. And um, I was the guy that would, you know, do the demos and kind of supervise the sessions, bring the band in, kind of prepped. That was me. And yeah, I had, I had a four track cassette recorder, and yep. you know, I I kind of discovered recording stuff early, but I never thought of it ever being a career, you know. And uh, when the band broke up, that was in Northern California. Um, I moved up here to Portland, Oregon, because I've been on tour a lot, and I liked uh, I liked the scene up here. I liked the microbreweries, and I liked <laughs> that there was a, a lot of clubs to go see bands at. And I was dead set to get out of music, like not do the music business, not have anything to do with that kind of thing. Um, and the next thing I knew, I was like recording people in my basement, and um, fantastic. 
then the magazine started and then the basement studio turned into a professional studio in 1997 and moved out somewhere into a commercial space, you know. That's so it's all kind of a little weird, weird, weird path, you know. So it's all kind of gone hand in hand. Did the, the magazine started, like you said, to kind of interview people and get tips? Yeah, and just I wanted to – I looked at the other magazines. I was trying to read as much as I could, and, and um, there were a lot of books. Some of them were really good. Some of them weren't um, about music recording. And uh, I would look at the other magazines. i go buy them or go to the library, and, um, you know, they just weren't speaking to me. I'm not saying that they're good or bad or anything. They just weren't really talking to me in the way I worked, you know, like the kind of music I was into or – the kind of just the sort of like buy used equipment, put something together kind of system that I've all, most of us have always really had to do. Absolutely. You know, yeah. And so I um, started it really as like a zine, you know, like the sort of zine culture of underground stuff. And it was just folded paper that I Xeroxed and folded myself and stapled. You know, that was the first a few issues. And then I realized that was a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> and I took it to a printer. <laughs> Um, but you know, it was really just a labor of love. It's something I wanted to do. I've been writing for music, uh, magazines and newspapers and stuff like that for years before that as a, a reviewing albums and reviewing, reviewing shows and doing interviews. So I kind of had that, I knew that part of it, you know, but I wasn't really a journalist. I didn't think. And did yeah. you start that at college or interviewing local bands or um, college bands you know, and stuff? In college I was DJing a lot and I was Great. playing in a band, um, and recording people for fun, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, it probably kind of came out of that. You know, I, my friends had a magazine in the Bay Area that I used to write for, and there was a lot of stuff going on. It just kind of kept me busy. And, see, see, coming from England, like, you don't know how glamorous that sounds, you know, because <laughs> I'm like in a little little village in England, and when you hear words like the Bay Area, you oh, know, yeah. you've just got visions of Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, and Haight Ashbury, and it just oh, it this. Just, it just sounds this, glorious to to a, a kid from <laughs> Crookham Village in England. <laughs> this was more like a, a you know anarchists and and punk rock venues and things like that. <laughs> I, I relate to that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was fun, but um, yeah, I mean that all just kind of led. You know, sometimes you don't realize all the skills that you're building up. You know, and it was the point where I opened a Jackpot, my recording studio. Right. I realized, like, oh my god, I know how to how to frame a wall. I know how to wire a building. I know how to do all this stuff, you know, to build the studio space, the practical part of it. And, uh, you know, and the, and the engineering stuff, you just you just keep doing it over and over till you get it right, you know. <laughs> I think that's the basic rule of thumb. <laughs> I think it is. I think uh, I, I occasionally in the studios that I had, that I, my home studios, when I'd have like a quote-unquote real engineer come in, I would yeah. just kind of copy what they did. I, I always tell people when I, I – this is probably completely wrong if you went to school, which we didn't. But yeah. I, I, I would just say copy what somebody did, and after a while your ear will start to understand why they did it. I mean, right. I, I, I never – I'll be honest. When I first started, I couldn't hear the differences between ratios and compression. I didn't understand attack and release times. You know, you, you, you almost yeah. have to overdo it, go it completely wrong, and then mm – -hmm. Then hear how drastic it can be, and then suddenly, after about three years, you're hearing all the subtle differences. Yeah, you know, I, and it really, um, it, yeah, that was totally baffling to me. Yep. And the thing that I always tell people now is, is just study what ADSR is. Right. And then a compressor will start to make more sense. Just just learn how waveforms, the attack of a sound is shaped, and and what how that can change it. You know, because. People bring me things where they've over compressed stuff to while they were recording and they want me to mix it and the snare drum has like this peak and then it crushes it. <laughs> you know. It's so ping it's, flop. Yeah. yeah. It's like it's a <laughs> you know, little sound and yeah. you know, so I think if people kind of learn and you can visually see it now with, with recording in computers and stuff, you yeah. you can see what, what's wrong with the sound sometimes. Um so you know, there's it's a lot of ways to learn. I think that's really cool like that. You know? Yeah, definitely. But, it was. It was. Yeah. I suppose it was easier if you had like an SH one hundred and one because you had attack, decay, sustain, release. You had mm -hmm. the ADSR on the synth, so you right. could put a sound through it and shape the sound with the ADSR. Okay. Yeah, because I, I was really into synthesizers, even though I didn't own any hardly for years until now. But I would every time I'd get a chance to play with a Moog or something, I would just get there and put on headphones and mess around for hours. You know. That's awesome. So I just did always that part. 
of it always made a lot of sense to me. How does the sound enter the picture? How does it leave? And that's how everything works, you know, when you're recording, and that's how a compressor works, right? Absolutely. And so, so there you are. It's 96. You start this magazine, which is going to become one of these incredibly influential magazines, to help your own career and to learn and to and also to get- I certainly wasn't thinking of it helping a career at that point. I really, <laughs> honestly, it, it was so just a labor of love. You Wonderful. know, it wasn't. I didn't see. I I didn't want to restrict it and say, oh, it's just going to stay this little underground thing. But I just didn't have any vision of how to make it a bigger magazine, you know. With, uh, but but I also had the the knowledge. I, I talked to people that were doing things like this, and one friend said, "Just always just keep putting the issues out, and don't apologize if you're a little late. Just keep the coming out. Stay on a regular schedule. Send them to people that would be interested. You know, don't try to charge them when they don't haven't even seen it yet. And and just and so like I you know and I did the same thing when I had a record label for our band. I would send half the copies out as promotional, you know? Yeah. So I worked it, you know, I sent it to labels and, and bands that I knew and loved and all kinds of stuff. And it, and it kind of started and sent it to some small studios, people like Albini, stuff like that, you know, and send it around to those kind of folks and, right. and they dug it. So that's <laughs> fantastic. Know, grassroots. It's, it's so grassroots. I mean, that's the thing that it is really a grassroots. It's, it's nothing about a publishing company or anything like that. It's about, people that are just have share interests and in things and want to be involved, you know. And your reviews are always so honest. <laughs> that, Andy, How, Andy Hong is our reviews editor. Yeah. He is, he's got a really great sense of like um, usability. He's been hired as a usability consultant for people in the past and he's brilliant. So when someone does review something, he might check it and go, Hey, what about these things? You know, write some more stuff or he might add something. To the to the reviews too, and, and you know it's it's. I think the review section, and I've told him this is my mandate to Andy years ago, is that the review section should be like you and I get together and have pints after a session, mm -hmm. and we say what's what do you like, you know, or what do you think right. of that new such and such, and it's not you know like a jingle the keys in front of the mic kind of bullshit or or you yeah. know bench testing which bench testing is totally totally legit. I'm not saying that's not sure. a real thing. But you know, I don't give a fuck about the specs. Just let me run it and see sure. what it does on my session. And so it's really like people hanging out talking over beers and and saying and usually the reviews actually if you really read them most of them are are pretty positive. We don't really generally no. review something if we don't like it to some degree. But we'll I we'll critique it about, you know, usability stuff and what yeah. it's like in the real world. I, I agree. I, I just I feel like um, it's interesting because when you when you did working class audio the other day, mm -hmm. that's great because Matt's like one of my heroes. I I, I love great. Matt. Yeah, and Matt's like yeah. completely comes from the same place we're talking about. That yeah. just kind of like in a band decided to you know we love music so much. How do we carry on our career after you know? For me, it's like. Oh, I'm in my, you know, I'm 32 and I'm not going to get signed as the good looking <laughs> <laughs> young guy. So. Yeah. And just I, like you, um, you know, when you first started saying, I, I was kind of the guy that would always be tapping the engineer on the shoulder, asking the stupid <laughs> question, you know. And, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it, it, this, this was a natural progression for me, but I, yeah, there was no schooling, there was no assistant, assisting in a studio, as much as I wish now I kind of had some. You know, I couldn't build up credits by being the assistant on 50 big albums, you know. Um, right, right. So, and same thing as you. And the thing, the thing that your, your reviews have, though, is that maybe they're not, they're not, like, negative at all, but they're definitely honest. Yeah. Um, I get it. You know, why bother reviewing something just to trash it? If you don't like it, just don't review it. So I, I we, so, we passed on so many things, yeah. you know. And I completely That's... respect that because that – there's no sense in just putting negativity out there. So I respect no. that. But at the same time, if I read your reviews, I believe them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a hard yeah. time with some magazines, and I'm sure all of our viewers are going to agree with this, when they, when they pick up and look at a name many magazines, a big magazine, they read the review and then they turn the page and there's an advertisement, advertisement for the product right. that they just reviewed. Right. And that's right. a little, that's a little you tough. Know, some, sometimes that happens with us, and sometimes that only happens because – we send the review to be fact checked by the manufacturer in you know, case we get something really wrong, you yeah. know, or miss or miss a point or you know whatever. We might we'll take we'll take into consideration what they say, and sometimes we do that. We send them the review and they go, "Oh, that's great! Can I buy an ad?" 
<laughs> and then, <laughs> then you get an angry email from someone who goes, well, I see why you're writing those reviews. And it's actually the opposite. So <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think you, there's always going to be people angry at everybody, and I, I to, and, and that's, apparently, <laughs> apparently, yeah. But I don't think any of us in in a you know guys like you and I that are in the trenches, like hustling and making a living, that really believe that because no. you got great integrity. I mean, look, you 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 just interviewed Daniel Miller. I mean, that's awesome. I don't yes, you know, being out of. <laughs> I remember you know Mute Records. I, I, that's that's a big deal for me. You know, yeah, and, and, yeah, and just. It's it's finding people like that, and for me, people like you, and being able to, to interview them just to just to show people that even at a time in like the mid '90s, which was the days of like millions of record sales and money coming out of yeah. people's ears, that there were still people outside doing really good stuff like you. Because oh yeah, I mean there were tons of people like my my friend who I helped start my studio with was Elliot Smith, you know, and he'd done his first record on his first solo record on a four track cassette and the next one was an eight track half inch Tascam. Right. You know, and he was making records that were getting a lot of acclaim. And, you know, you're you're looking at that and then you're looking at Mix magazine, for instance. I don't want to pick on my friends over there, but no. you know, back in the day you look at it and there'd be a cover with an SSL and a really nice design studio and you're like, well, these records aren't being made there. You know, that's kind of the sure. the difference. There's there's there are great records made in every studio. You know, Absolutely. and there's bad records made in every studio. Oh, yes. And I'm but sure I've made was, some of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm luckily not working on one of those right now. But, uh, yeah, you know, it's 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 just, I think you got to be careful when you talk about the whole process of making records because it's creating art and there's there's no rules. So you can, yeah. I could tell you, you know, well, I don't want to hear a record with quantized drums and then you play me some record that's got quantized drums and it's great. So yep. I don't know, man, I'm not going to. You know, yeah. I'm, like this record I'm working on right now, we're using auto tune, everything's on the grid, and it doesn't sound like that, you know? So it's like any any rules you might throw at this, you're totally wrong, you know? And sure. and when if you try to think of record making as only being done in, in high class, you know, two thousand dollar a day studios, then you're you're wrong too, you know. And I think that was kind of my attitude in ninety six was like like I wanna learn more about how these underground records are made or you know, even older classic records that were made simply, you know, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'm reading a book right now on uh, Sam Phillips, you know, and about Sun, Sun Studios or, or Memphis Recording Services. And uh, Peter Goralnik wrote it. It's a fantastic book. It's about that thick. It's, it's gigantic. And it's just fun to read it because you're like, the real truth about Sam as a record producer is he was just waiting for the hair in the back of his neck to stick up. He just yeah. wanted to hear a performance where he went, that's the one. And Wonderful. he would put out records that had mistakes all over them. And and, he, and you could listen, they've listened to the reels of the stuff. And they're like, well, there were actually more proficient takes before the hit one, you know, but that one was the one that was exciting. And that's what he was waiting for. And I think, you know, that's another truth right there that, you know, maybe it, don't worry about it, you know, just get the exciting thing, exciting performance, you know, in some cases. So there's so many ways, you know. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think, yeah, and especially some genres when you went going back to what you're talking about, like the perfecting stuff. Yeah. If I'm in a, if I'm in a room with four incredible musicians, I don't want to grid the crap out of it, but if I'm doing some kind of like crazy rock intricate kind of, kind of stuff, oh, yeah. it's it, got to be done. It's got to yeah. be done. It, it really comes down to the genre. And then of yeah. course there's genres of in genres, you know, there's like, yeah. A, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> It's interesting sometimes. I mean, you know, I think there's, I think that one of the points I've always made with the magazine is like, if you're an artist, then look for someone whose work in the studio that you think would be sympathetic to your needs. You know, like try to figure out, don't, don't go to a place because they have X amount of tracks or microphones or the size of the recording room or anything, but try to figure out someone who's going to help produce your record and, and be really sympathetic to what you need as an artist and, and I really try to drive that home all the time with tape Absolutely. off because I, I think I miss I, I hear horror stories all the time you know of mismatched you know engineer producers and artists and you know what what can you say to that you know you're like well you, you pick the wrong person I don't care yeah, if you're it's, that's a, diff you that's a difficult one it's almost like um, because I think unfortunately for a, a, a lot of people is they they pick 
they pick the producer or the engineer based on a resume, and that can be good, but it can also be very misleading because right. um, I'm, I'm not going to pick on any, any producer, but I'll just say a band. Say something like U2. If you, mm. Let's just say U2 had, U2 had had only one or two producers. They've obviously had several. Let's yeah. just say they'd only had one or two. Does that mean that their producer is part of the sound, or does it mean that U2 are bringing that? I mean, I, I would like to think guys like The Edge – who I would argue is probably the most yeah. influential guitar player of the last 40 years. He's changed it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they know what they want to do, you know, and, yeah. and, and but they also have taken a lot of guidance from people like Eno and Lenoir and Steve Lillywhite, you know. But, you know, yeah, I mean, you if you hire Steve Lillywhite, you might also get a Pogues record or something. I mean, it's not, he's not stuck in one way of working and, and none of those people are, of course. Sure. You know, and it, I mean, and the thing is, at the end of the day, you're only going to get the record that the artist is really bringing in and can deliver. You know, I mean, generally, unless you really completely just strip it back and modify it. You know, when you're dealing with a band or something, you know, you're they're they are probably a unique thing that that has to be captured to a certain degree and then and then produced. You know, if you're dealing with a songwriter who's wide up, and then sure, there's a lot of places you could go, but you know, you're not. If the songwriter likes a U2 record, they're not going to sound like U2, you know? I know, absolutely. So um, you, you, you're you right in a scene. I mean, when you were there in 96 on, I mean, that was like kind of a such a hotbed. I mean, yeah. You know. I mean, I, I was really lucky. Um, when, I, when I moved up here, I knew some of the bands already because they all the ones that were popular at that time had opened for us when we were on tour, you know? Right. So, um I knew a lot of the bands that were going on then and uh uh you know that that was kind of a nice I was going to shows a lot. I was playing I started a band again up here um and had a had a few iterations of that. And so I was playing shows with these same people. So that was a great way to to get awesome. things rolling, you know. But but it was lucky. I mean, early on it was like, you know, Elliot Smith and uh um, the Sleater Kenny and the Decemberists and stuff like that. So amazing! Time. I mean, that's that's a good resume right there. I guess it's a fantastic resume. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know. But I was also because I was really connected with um, journalism and a lot of other stuff. I was able to to get the go betweens to do a reunion record here with with Wonderful. Janet from Sleater Kenny and and I had bands even when I had a home studio. I had bands coming through from New Zealand and Canada and stuff and staying at my house and recording weird records and things that came out on Matador records. So, wow. I mean, I was kind of connected, you know, I had Cat Power recorded in my basement. Stephen Alchemist recorded demos for Pavement in my basement. Wonderful. Um, so all that kind of stuff was happening even before I opened the studio. I, you know, I've always tell people like, like don't build a studio unless people are asking you to work with them, you know, because there's no point. It's not recording equipment is boring as shit. <laughs> Studios are boring as shit. I hate the whole thing, except I love making records and making art with great musicians, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's all that mattered. And I had all these people just kind of going, Hey, could you put together a studio? Or maybe we could work at it. You know, like I was booked up as soon as I opened the door, you know? So it's wonderful. You know, it's, it's not just unusual. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. A wonderful story. I, I had just today somebody messaged me and said um, they'd watched one of the videos and said, thank you. It was very positive and really helped me. But how do I get the word out there about my studio? And so I said, it's not about the studio. It's about you. Yeah. I had a business partner out here and I tried to blew in, my, blew in the face to explain to him that when we were busy was when I was busy. Right. You know, I was the main engineer. When I was busy, the studio was busy. If we'd had another engineer who was out there hustling, we'd be busier still. It, right. It, bricks and mortar, as you know, as you just explained perfectly, bricks and mortar don't make money. It's that no. they're, they're a means to an end. And, and there's obvious reason why larger studios, except for the ones that just have inherent sounds and, and, and vibe and, and history, like Sunset Sound and United oh, yeah. and th those, in, at least where I live, you know, those studios have so much to offer beyond bricks and mortar, then I, I think yeah. that they will always have a place. But for a, a generic 1980s pine studio, you know, with Osbergers <laughs> and, a, and a 9K, you yeah. know, good luck, you know. Yeah, I mean, it, it really has to be more than just this, this, the equipment in the room. You yeah. know, there has to be some reason that people want to use the space. And, 
And, uh, you know, even my places this month has been dead, you know, I mean, I've had jobs and, and stuff, but I'm not as busy as it could have been, you know, sure. we try to get, we, we have a really good system where freelancers are really comfortable and can, can walk in and basically start working in, in minutes, you know, it's very laid out, very, very clearly and simple. There's no quirks, there's nothing weird. And, uh, and even then, you know, it's just really hard, you know, to get, to fill all the days, you know. Right. Well, I, I want to check it out. Yeah, it's a fun place. <laughs> well, tell, tell us a little bit about it. What's your what's your sort of basic layout? Well, it's it's um, we have like about a six hundred square foot live room with Wonderful. three ISO three ISO booths and about eleven foot or so ceilings and uh, oak floors and tie lines. I put in tie lines. I was able to consult with the uh, architect before this place was built. And my friends, um, there's a company called Hamptone that makes like uh, preamps and. Uh, tube mic power supplies, um, uh, lots of custom equipment, fixes mics, all kinds of stuff. And he's my, he's my landlord and his, he and his wife own the building. Wow. And, um, that I was able to talk to them about, you know, what, what would they, they built it for me to, to move into. So it was a really great situation. When I was a kid, you know, about the same age, we we're just talking about, we're about the same age. When I was a kid, you know, I grew up on queen and, oh yeah, you know, John Bonham Probably. was still alive when I was buying records. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, um, yeah. And uh, Aerosmith a little bit. Um, they weren't as big in England as they were over here. So it was mainly British rock bands. Yeah. And British rock bands were better anyway. <laughs> yeah, but you had a, you, you, the one thing. Except I we would, had Cheap Trick. <laughs> you, had, you had Cheap Trick. Um, but actually, of all the things that you guys had, you had Detroit and New York. You had... Mm. When it comes to rock and roll, you had Iggy oh, yeah. and you had the Velvet Underground. That's pretty good shit. That's, I mean, that's <laughs> there's a great John Peel quote, and I know you're a very yeah. musically educated person, so you oh, probably yeah. know this quote. But John Peel said that the Velvet Underground didn't sell many records, but every record, <laughs> the, the, every record that, that every guy that bought a Velvet Underground record started a band. Oh yeah, yeah. I started a band soon after hearing the first record. <laughs> yeah, I mean. It's true. Those albums were amazing. And then Solo, Lou Reed, just, yeah. just before he died, a couple of years before he died, I got to be friends with Dick Wagner, who had mm -hmm. played on Rock and Roll Animal and played yeah. with Peter Gabriel and, and right. played with Kiss and Aerosmith. And it like, you know, it was that was a real treat for me. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that guy had a history. Yeah. And then, of course, you had you guys had Iggy. Yeah. That's a special thing. That's a very <laughs> special thing. I mean, he really is. It really is punk rock. And for me, like, Raw Power is just the best, wrongest album ever. <laughs> Especially the early mix, the Bowie mix. Oh, I love the Bowie it's mix. So, it's so strange. When you that know? Search and Destroy guitar solo comes in, like, three <laughs> times louder than the rest of the band. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just, I always assumed there was a hell of a lot of blow going on. But I think there probably I was. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I am, um, I am, um, I, 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 I was very fortunate. I was, uh, I was, working with this band and uh in the room next door iggy was rehearsing and yeah. uh, this is many years ago and the door cracks open and this guy kind of comes in like dragging his feet and i look around and it's iggy pop and i'm just like freaking out and he had a <laughs> little mini disc recorder and he was doing demos with his band you remember yt is guitar player and stuff so yeah. they were doing demos and he's like he's got that voice like this and he's like, he goes could you burn this to a cd and so I'm like, sorry, it's not a very good Iggy, but it's my best Iggy. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. I said, but, you know, I don't have any kind of connectors to do this digitally, so I'll just have to come out of the mini jack and run it audio and burn it in real time. And he went, yeah. okay, and just sat down. And <laughs> for like two and a half hours. Oh, my God. He just told, told us stories. And we were just nice. like little kids like this. Oh, yeah. Please, right. Mr. Pop, tell us something else. And it was just oh, yeah. like. Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> it's weird when you meet your idols, you know, it's, it's kind of a strange, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, I, I mean, if I had to do that, I wasn't doing interviews, you know, a lot. And yeah. it's, it's when it's someone you really, really just studied and been excited about for years, it's always kind of an interesting thing. And the weird thing is they're usually awesome, you know, yeah. <laughs> they're usually pretty easy going and, and happy with what they've done. You know, I'm, I, I, I met Jeff Beck, um, in like 2000 and that was amazing because for guitar players he's like the pinnacle for me yeah. and i was terrified to meet him 
I, I, I really <laughs> thought he was going to be Nigel Tufnell and be throwing the guitar down and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Um, and he actually turned out to be a complete sweetheart, and we had a great day together, and we jammed, <laughs> and it was a, a day that I'll never forget. But the only person, I don't know about you, I'd love to know who your guy is, the only person for me that I would be completely starstruck over is Brian May. And I came out of a music, I came out of a movie theater maybe seven or eight years ago. And I come out and there is Brian May standing in front of me. He's like 900 feet tall. He's so tall and skinny. He had that huge afro, but now it's gray. Yeah. And he was yeah. standing with what I imagine was his son because a guy looks exactly like him, but 25 <laughs> years younger with the same, but dark hair. And they're standing together. And I'm like, I'm like, what do I do? I've got a few ins. I know him and Jeff Becker friends. I could say no. Yeah. And, and I'm just like, I just stand there for a second and he's like three feet away from me. And I look at him and I'm like, nah, just, yeah. Sometimes you just walk away. It's like, oh. what do you do? What do you do? Who's your guy? Is there somebody that just, who would it be? Who would it be? Well, I thought it was Brian Eno, but I got to meet him. So let's see. Ah, Eno. Yeah. <laughs> You know a lot, but you know if I I, would, I swear if either David Gilmore or Roger Waters would kind oh, of blow Roger up, Waters, right? Oh, that would freak. That that's a little heavy yeah. and weird to me. I, I think that's probably the band that I've thought about the most oh, when I was really? like a teenager and stuff, and Woo. poured over those records and studied the hell out of them. You know, you know, kids. And when I mean kids, I mean anybody watching this. If if you're not a fan of the Wall, become a fan of the Wall. Oh yeah. Um, it is a masterpiece of production. It's so succinct. Every guitar part has a place. Every part in the song has a place. It, it's yeah. insane how good it is. And it's a double album. So there's a lot yeah. of incredible. It was music. done in, in nine months. In nine months. You know, you know, Bob Ezrin producing was certainly a big factor in Absolutely. keeping things on track, I'm sure. And, 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 and working with Roger to, to tighten that story. Oh yeah, and everything you know, but it's it's an interesting. The evolution of that album is really interesting, and it was a massive undertaking, and it basically kind of broke the band up, you know, basically, <laughs> you know. Yep. But uh, you know, I went and saw a bunch of his shows on the Wall tour that Roger did last few years, like 2010 or 11 on. I saw him about three times, and wow. uh, they were fantastic. It was really an amazing spectacle. You I, know? I saw I saw the Wall as a kid. I think 81 or 82. Like a Wembley or something. Yeah, and they—I yeah. don't know what they did now, but then what they did is they had like um, a wall up, and then the wall collapses and oh, the bands yeah. behind yeah, it. Yeah, same thing. Oh. <laughs> it was insane. The wall just keeps getting built up, yeah. and yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> oh, it's, it's so great! And yeah, I'm a huge, yeah. I'm a huge Roger Waters fan. As much as I like Dave Gilmore and and Nick Mason yeah. and Rick White, to me, it's like. You took out the main songwriter out of the band, and now you're left with an incredible instrumental band. But really good instrumental band. Really but, great uh, instrumental band. Don't get me different. wrong. Yeah, very different. <laughs> yeah, but that oh, his songs. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm so glad it translates to you because to me, I you know, the wall is such an English experience. The story right. of the Second World War and his father did actually right. die in the war, and all of those things um, uh, is pretty intense. And even like growing up in like the 70s and 80s in England. There was still yeah. that kind of like doom and gloom overhanging, you know. Sure, I mean it wasn't that it wasn't that long since World War Two had ended, and and, yeah. and you know, large large parts of Britain were just beat to shit. So, yeah. you know, it was a tough time. It was a tough time, and and you know, well, I mean, I could go on in the history, but <laughs> no, I love this stuff. Let's have a show here. <laughs> oh yeah, there it is. Um, this just so this just came out. Um, which is uh, let's see, is that like, oh wow! Uh, Roger uh, put out a it's a, it's kind of it's a movie of a, of one of the concerts, and and it's also like got extra stuff added in to kind of thematically uh, explain some of it and his father and World War Two and some of the things that were going on. Oh wow! But the crazy thing about it is that he lost both his his grandfather died in World War One, his father died in World War Two. So that's kind of a, a crazy. I never knew that. No, I didn't know that either. So yeah. that's so he's he's not into war. <laughs> no, he's pretty outspoken. Um, oh yeah, he's pretty outspoken. And sometimes I like go yay, <laughs> and other times I'm like whoa. You know, it's he's definitely incredibly opinionated. But you know, like I'm sure you read Left Sets as well. Le one of Left Sets' yeah. things, and I have to agree with him entirely. Is like 
what happened to our rock stars that used to actually believe in things? Right, right. Exactly, right? Yeah, I mean... Well, it's it, everything... What's really strange is what we see in, in modern uh, entertainment, so to speak, is that our we've been granted too much access into a lot of entertainers where their managers should be interceding and stopping them from posting dick pics or saying <laughs> stupid things. Right. And, uh, and we're also being given them, um, um, because people are more hyper aware of how image comes off we're given a lot of like whitewashed kind of weird bland things to, to supposedly worship, sure, you know, sure. but, but I think that people's, intuition is usually correct about that and they know that it makes it feel disposable to them whereas you know you could spend your lifetime trying to, to scrutinize bob dylan's work and, and his life and try to make sense of it or roger waters or or somebody or follow eno's various escapades or you know whomever you know laurie anderson would be a great example you know you could yeah, spend yeah. a lot of time looking at these artists and trying to figure out what they're thinking and doing and and it's it's a fascinating puzzle as a fan a music fan God, yeah. I mean, I think of, yeah. you're touching on a, a few of my favorites there, like Dylan, Neil yeah. Young, Joni yeah. Mitchell. Like those, those, are, those three just for me, and of course John Lennon. Um, mm -hmm. Every single one of them, like Dylan, one minute he's like uh, he's a Midwesterner who moves yeah. to New York, reinvents <laughs> himself, Definitely. you know, and then rediscovers the fact that he's Jewish, so becomes very Jewish. Then he decides – He's going to do become a born again Christian, and he does right. slow train coming, which is a masterpiece of an album. Right, a, incredible. I mean, like remember that song, "God Made All the Animals in the Beginning, Long Time Ago." Yeah, <laughs> with Mark Knopfler <laughs> playing on it before Dire Straits oh, were big. Right, it's I mean, crazy, right? a great record. And yeah. then, and now, and, and then he became a rabbi, and now he's back. Yeah. I mean, the point is, is like I. The point is, is like it's warts and all. It's it's yeah, it, yeah. You get to see the art, and you get to see the man, and and Neil Young, same thing. You know, remember, you know, you, I'm sure you know the story. Geffen's like, oh yeah, you know that album comes the time. You should yeah. do another album like that. So what does he do? He goes off and does trans and starts yeah. singing through like a, you know, everything becomes synthesizers and a vocoder and. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it's it's. You know, it's nice to have people like that where you can look at it and kind of believe in it yeah. to some degree because they're they're they are just taking risks and doing stuff and saying things and and living life and you know it's it's a much more con controlled and uncontrolled environment now with internet and everything that we have and it's interesting I find it interesting to to look at the changes you know I mean like you don't you don't ever know much about like what say Radiohead is up to right you know. Yeah. But then again, they might post a whole blog about the making of a record at some point or something. Sure. So you're like, it's it's you know, it's a different time. It's very weird. Yeah, exactly. We have we have great bands still. Thank God, there's still Muse. There's still Radiohead. There's still yeah. stuff that is is really exciting and and hits, yeah. hits on all the levels. Hits you musically. Hits you production. Hits you most importantly, incredible songs. What yeah. I get worried about sometimes, and and and. You've been involved with some some great independent artists, far more than I have on most people. Do you find that sometimes there's a fear with independent artists to write really good songs because they think it's too pop or they're selling out? <laughs> I, I really want to know. What do you think? Huh. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, it's hard to say. Like, would you want to try to cater to an audience or or something or or not? You know, but it's like if you look at the restrictions that are applied to certain bands too, like how broad of a fan base can they get on this label or through these channels? You know, sometimes it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it's not going to present itself anyway. So you could write, I mean, a great point would be Slater Kenny's song. Um, You're no rock and roll fun is a really, really catchy song that they Very wrote on, yeah. on the first record I did with them. Me and, and John Goodmanson, who was the producer on that, who is fantastic. Um, and so, that's a really catchy song. Right. It's really short and focused and it's really great. And, you know, in a different universe, that might be a number one song, but in the marketplace of that time and, and being on, um, on kill rock stars, I think at the time, um, you know, it, it's just not, it, it's going to be presented in a different way. And people are really, it, consumers are really highly aware of that. You know, like, do I have to go to the weird record store back then to buy it? Or instead, it's not a Best Buy. Or maybe it probably was a Best Buy, but you know what I mean? Sure. It's it's just coming down a different channel. You know, I think that's one of the things, like, 
uh, someone, one of my clients was asking me about all these different things. Like, have you listened to this? And I'm like, you know, look, my music is coming down a far different channel than, than where I'm taking music from. And if I know that, you know, then I'm, I'm kind of just not paying attention to it sometimes. It's like, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying that, you know, if a band looks like a band comes from a city that I've been in for years and they've never played a show and they've come up on a major label and they're all groomed and clean and they have professional things happening. I'm like, it's probably too slick for my taste. I probably don't need to listen to that. It's not my, not, I'm not the demographic, <laughs> right. you know, I want the, I want the warts and all, you know, the band that was touring in a, in a van, you know, with an EP to sell out of a box, you know, I mean, those are probably, that's probably where the roots of what I'm interested in are not to say I don't listen to things that are, massively huge or like yeah. the new Adele record or, or something like that or Florence and the Machines another one lately that is in the car full time you know Wonderful super show. fun and big shows you know so I just think we were blessed and uh, not to try and sound like the old guy here um, <laughs> well, back in my day <laughs> back in my day but we were blessed because the bands that we've just been talking about hit on all the levels so you had a band yeah. like Pink Floyd who were massively successful, so one of the biggest selling bands of all time. Right. They could do edgy, dark, weird, wonderful, pop, anything. They could do whatever right. they wanted. And and that's sometimes, and this is just an esoteric conversation, this is sometimes what I miss about a lot of modern bands is they're a li- the, I just wish they would, I, I want it all. I'm, I'm, I've got very high standards. I want, I want yeah. David Bowie pretty much every time. I want somebody to, <laughs> you know, I mean, the new well, Bowie, well, I absolutely love it. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. You know, I, I think that some, there's a little more of a, of a full, like if someone's trying to become very successful, the, the, the way that, say, a band like Pink Floyd started doesn't exist anymore. Right. You know, not necessarily, you know, getting signed a couple of years in and being on a major label and being at EMI and recording, you know, with no overhead you know, and, and with Norman Smith and is that you don't, and, and having the channels to have a hit single, like right out the gate, you know, the sure. CMA play was like a hit right at the gate. Um, you know, with no album, nothing, no, no packaging. They were just the hit band of the moment and it worked. I mean, that, that world doesn't exist. And then they lost Sid and they went on to be like a weird spacey art rock band for a while. Umagama. Yeah. Umagama. Yeah. I mean, those are weird records, you know, yeah. <laughs> and then they had dark side of the moon. So it's like, you know, they build up to it and, and it's like those that's a that's a career path that you know I don't see any major label letting anyone do at this point as far as I know you know I mean the only kind of bands that kind of live like that at all in some sort of sense would be like Wilco or something you know where they're able to do what they want and 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 get their records out there and just kind of do it the way they want to do it you know at a certain level you know sure so, but I mean and, there, and there's a handful of people that get to work that way and that's awesome but uh, you know it's it it was it that's you know, people that are 20 plus years into a career already you know and now we're saying oh they're successful finally you know <laughs> like so yeah. i don't I, know it's it's different no i, I agree I, I i agree with you 100 percent. i i think actually what's exciting um is that the only way rock bands now can get anywhere and be successful is to work really hard and they ha- it's going back to its roots because I don't, I, I know major labels, and they're not signing anything rock and roll at all. No, it doesn't. It probably doesn't look appealing, you know. No, <laughs> if it, for someone putting an investment and in, in staking a, a career on on something, you know, oh, they're going to break up next week anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? So the way to do it is to is to just tough it out, which I think is like a whole metaphor. And coming back to how we started doing what we do, and how and. What I love, and the reason why I love Matt, and I love what you do, and why your magazine, and why you are so successful at it, and what I'm trying to tap into here is, we we were doing things outside of the system before that was even available to people, and that's what's so interesting. Right. Now we have the good old interwebs, as our ex-president yeah. used to call it. <laughs> the great thing about the internet is you can actually be successful. Uh, I'm not saying everybody's going to become a, a multi-millionaire internet guy. But if you do something great, you can get it out there. I mean, the internet's crazy, and it all works in different ways. But you know, and, and, and for someone trying to say promote their band, they're kind of there's a glut. But for someone trying to network and do other things sure. or work within genres, there's a lot of healthy things. It's really awesome. Yeah, it's fantastic. 
Yeah. And um, well, so as you're approaching your 20th year, are you going to do any uh, exciting stuff? We were trying to figure out how to throw a party or something, but um, well, we, this this is funny. We so we have the the tape off beer, obviously, <laughs> with camera, right? So so we do have this this beer, uh, nice. Overdub IPA, and um, it um, this came out earlier this year, and they're going to be re releasing that beer around uh, March or something. And so my, we were talking about doing a party with the beer uh, with Fort George, the brewery. And stuff and doing some. I, I don't know. It's just it's really hard because a lot of our staff is actually in the Bay Area and Sacramento and that area, and then people are in New York and Boston and Austin and the, everyone's spread out. And you know, I don't want to force everyone to come to me. You know, and I, I don't know. I, we'll probably have an issue where we mention something about being twenty years, but I don't know what's going to happen at this point. <laughs> you know, I want to try to get maybe you know at least a little recognition. Do some you know, get some interviews out or something at that point, hopefully, and talk to people about it. But uh, Well, if you do a party, I'd love to come out and film it and, you know. And so we're going to have fun if we it. do yeah. something. But I, I don't know. We talked about doing two different parties, and that makes it hard for people to figure out where to go. And, and I just, you know, I'm kind of overwhelmed with work at this point. <laughs> I hear you. Um, I've got uh, my lynda.com videos. I, I need to get a bunch of those ready for, uh, for some shooting coming up. And then... Uh, I've got sessions in the magazine, and uh, um, I got a house. I, I'm glad you probably can't see how bad it is, but my office is like a, a, a war zone in here. I just put a photo on Twitter, so maybe people can look at that. And <laughs> it's a disaster. <laughs> so, look, when we got cut off, uh, the one yeah. thing I wanted to talk about um, was uh, your studio. So we got pretty much as far yeah. as 600 square foot oh, yeah, right. live room, and then it kind of – collapsed yeah so well it's, it's but, but the great thing was i was able to just help design it because my friends are the landlords the hampton audio company and and such are, are the owners and so i was able to sit in and design stuff like how i was running the i put pvc pipes underneath the pour for the cement for the what? foundation and for the floor and i was able to run all my cables through there they pop up in the walls and we have custom metal panels with xlrs and everything and uh, and we ran all the wiring is in shielded conduit up above your head in the walls, and then it drops down, and every outlet's on its own breaker. I mean, it's a really nice setup for for a studio. That's fantastic. And and it just you know the rooms are big, they sound good, the control room is rather large compared to most, and and that just helps make it easier to deal with, and and to have you know you always have more people than you ever expect, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so. You know, we were able to do a lot of stuff like that, and I really love it. We don't have any, hardly any storage. We have a little spot above the restroom where we can stash things. But uh, beyond that, you know, it's just a, a really great place to work. And we're in a really cool neighborhood where there's a lot going on. You know, there's food and food carts and a French bakery and burritos and good stuff. Dude, I want to move so. to Portland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got the ideal spot, man. It's good. And then – um What's your sort of? Uh, do you have a console? Do you have an outboard? What's your? Oh yeah, I mean we we have a Rupert Neve Designs uh, fifty eighty eight. Nice. That, um, it's number twenty seven, I think, of, of those. And uh, I I requested one that doesn't have any mic pre's or EQs or anything on it. It's just a mixing board, you know, and it, and it's routing and mixing. And I think it's I personally think it's one of the best consoles built in the world right now. Oh, wow. Consoles, no automation, no nothing. It's just, you know, perfect summing, you know, 45 volt plus and minus rails and in discrete and transformer bay balanced, you know, it's, it's amazing. It's just, you, you can't blow it out. It's amazing. And, and what's your choice of recording medium? Well, we got a, we have a couple of Otari MX 80s, two, two inch decks, and we've got a two, a 16 track and a 24 track set up ready to go. And then I've got uh, Pro Tools and Logic running uh, on a Burl mothership, that 24 in and out, and also an Avid uh, 16 IO, one of the new ones. And uh, so we can pretty much even do like uh, whatever that, how many channels is that, 40? <laughs> we yeah. can do 40 channels of, of digital through, through pretty damn good converters. And, um, and uh, you know, that's, and we got outboard, we got tons of stuff, a lot of the new boutique stuff, the retro 176s, I got a couple of those, and, and uh, the old 1176s and some old quad eight gear and, you know, Mercury and Daking and 
Great River and I mean AEA, you know, radio, everybody that's making something. It's ridiculous right now, you know. There there you go. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's like we have tons. I know and I know what that is. That's just that's where it lives. Yeah. On that's that a, piano. A good idea. It's perfect. Just, yeah, you know? it doesn't doesn't move. It's on the piano the whole time. Unless I'm gonna do a, a vocal with it, it's that's where it lives. Yeah. yeah I mean there's there's so many like talking about the AES show. There are so many boutique manufacturers right now who make fantastic stuff. Wonderful. I'm really not interested in, in vintage equipment. I don't have very much. I, I have no interest in, in having something that breaks and I have to spend thousands to fix it. You know, so I've got like a new Telefunken U47, and I've got some of the old Soundalox David Box mics and and uh, Blue Bottle and 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 things like that that are new and they can be serviced and. The Royer mics, the AEA mics, like we're talking about, all these great companies making great stuff. I mean, I'm I'm kind of different in that I don't have any interest in in dealing with older stuff generally. Yeah, you know? I, I I kind of feel you, and I I've got the new Steve Jackson Poltex. To be honest, mm -hmm. they sound as good as the vintage ones that I had. Um, so those those have gone because right. the vintage ones you can get three times as much money for. I mean, that's kind of the deal. I've sold stuff in the past just because it was worth too much, and I could get something just as good for less. I know. Um, S screw it. Mark at BAE is just about to launch. Um, you know the uh, the graphics, the API graphics with the Avidas twenty five twenties in it, which of course arguably better than the 2520s did i say that live right um, yeah <laughs> so and i have a couple of graphics that are like from the 70s so i can probably right. get 300 dollars more each for those than i can right but I like mean, you that, said the bae that, one will sound probably better probably better with the avidas yeah. mods yeah i mean that's i mean i think that's a great thing if people want to be into vintage equipment that's that's up to them um i don't think I mean, at the end of the day, if you got half decent equipment, it doesn't. You're good, you yeah. know. And, and the magic is not in you know an old Altec compressor or something. Sure. You know, it's in knowing how to apply everything you've got. And that I think people are really, I think, incredibly misguided about recording equipment. You right. know, like if you imagine, you know, and you probably try this, but if you if you do a shootout with a say like all your small diaphragm mics or something like that. In a, in a way, it doesn't really tell you that much. It, it just kind of, in that moment, that kind of sounded better maybe at that place. I mean, right. it's such it's it's such esoteric information to me. I don't know if I like a mic or a piece of gear for like two or three years, and then I've kind of gravi the, gradually sort of figured out what I like to use it for, you know? Right. And, and um, I think people are just, they think that, I don't know if they're trying to... In some cases, trying to find a, a deal or whatever, that's fine. But I think you you just need to have like a, a variety of good pieces of gear and then stop and just make records because it's, it's I just agree. not. I mean, I, I honestly became de-snobbified, is that a phrase, de-snobbified, mm -hmm. out of necessity. Um, yeah. The biggest one for me was pretty recent um, and uh, they don't. They don't pay me to say this, but I really like that company, Lewitt, because they make like these mm. mics that are like AKGs, but they're like half the price. And right. I, they're everywhere. Look, I've got them like uh, I got one on my hi hat, awesome. they're on my overhead. Yeah. Like, right. you know, and they're like, you know, 300 bucks. And right. it was out of necessity because I have lots of nice mics. I'm sure you do too, but it's hard to have pairs of anything. Because mm -hmm. you yeah, know, a sixty-seven is like you know a, a payment for a car. You know, buying it is like sorry, it is a car. A yeah, forty. It, so if you've got one of those, it's like oh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but to have a pair, and so out of necessity, somebody told me, oh, there's this LCT five fifty. It's really good, and the, and then then gave me this spiel about that they match them perfectly. So I was right. like, so I I borrowed a pair. And right. so for about a thousand or twelve hundred dollars, I had a pair of what sounded like full fourteens, but at half the price. Now I'm not saying Lou are the only people. There are other manufacturers, right. but that's exactly what you're saying. It's like it's suddenly out of necessity, you know, because nobody's going to buy. I, I couldn't even think of buying two eighty sevens, let alone two four fourteens. <laughs> yeah, you know. It, it, I mean, I think that you know. That, I mean, the thing I always try to tell people is is, is get what you can afford and then really learn it, you know? Yeah. And, and I think every, I think that's what I mean by misguided is people are so 
intent if you look on forums and stuff they're looking up signal paths and all these things sure. they'll they'll write me questions about what Elliot Smith recorded through and I'm like whatever's laying around it didn't matter yeah. you know it's just, absolutely irrelevant information and his guitar I, I, um, I, I used to live in Silver Lake and um, yeah. like the 15 years the first 15 years I was here and I remember uh, you, whenever you would play I mean, he always played like a crappy 70s Yamaha guitar. Yeah. And I have the same crappy Yamaha 70s guitar, and I put a mic in front of it, usually a 57. So yeah. it's really good. <laughs> right. It sounds yeah, really good. To, and I, I recently met the Yamaha rep because I bought um, some, a Yamaha guitar, and I, the, the guy came and gave it to me. And I said to him, oh, that's my main tracking guitar. And he's like, well, what is it? I was like, oh, it's like a 70-something Yamaha. And he's like, why? I'm like, because I heard Elliot Smith playing one, and then I recorded it and realized it sounded amazing, and it was $120. <laughs> right. I know it's crazy, and it, it's like, you know, the, the more important thing with him was that he spent the time to, to practice yeah. and write, you know? And sure. it's like, you know, I think people are just, I think everyone's looking for an easy way out, and they want to, you know, put up the certain signal chain or right. or, or whatever and have this magic thing happen where it's like, you know, honestly, end of the day, the magic comes from the people who are good at what they do. I agree. I, one of the first just, uh, first videos I, I did, I, I, I said, uh, uh, creativity is king. I, I, I really believe that. It's like Dave German was the one that told me that when I was in a band and he was producing yeah. us. He said, name your top five records, and I named them all off. And he's like, none of those are recorded very well. Like Led Zeppelin right. 1 is like 36 hours and a lot of cocaine. And there's like yeah. tons of mistakes and things bleeding in, and but it's the passion, and they're just, right. you know, rec raw power. I mean, is raw power yeah, recorded well? Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean it's really it's really true. Like a lot of records we adore, if you really examine them, they're kind of funky, and uh, it's because there's a great performance and a great song, and it's just, you know. I mean, nobody ever bought a record because had a great bass tone. I mean, if anyone did, <laughs> only five people bought it for that reason. You know, I mean, it just doesn't. I There's agree. things that that just don't really matter. <laughs> exactly. But then guys like us, we put on, say, Tax Man, and we go, what a great bass tone. <laughs> right. And, and, those are, and I think those are great yeah. things to, to, yeah. uh, to, to as a fan of music, to understand and go, ooh, there's a thing on there that sonically makes me excited. There were things that made me excited on records long before I was producing records or engineering. And uh, and then just the sonic of a thing, like you, the guitars on Hey You would be a great example oh, or yeah. something, the Nashville guitar or something like that. You know, you're like, how'd they do that? Why does it sound so cool? You know, and you, 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 you they, those sounds jump at you and they make the song more interesting. And so we try to do, do that in our own ways. I mean, there's right. absolutely no reason to mimic anything that's been done, but there is a reason to go, well, why would this vocal sound better with a slap back than a plate reverb? There's a reason. It's it's history, you know. Yeah. You know. I often, I don't know about you. A lot of my process is to inspire my artists. So sometimes we're listening to an old Elvis record. Sometimes we're listening to a Motown song. Sometimes we're listening to Queen. Sometimes we're listening to something that came out last week. And yeah. we maybe we're borrowing, you know, stealing ideas, but it's oh, yeah. inspiring. They 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 want they want to bring that emotion and that feeling they've got when you were talking earlier about the hair standing on the back of your neck yeah it's that i mean you you know i i you know i'm not saying that everything i've recorded is absolutely amazing i'm sure none of it is at all <laughs> but my point is is that's what i want to do right right i right. want that high bar and, right oh uh, absolutely it's something to shoot for but yeah it's always good to know when you're trying to create great art what the goal really is in not you know, I think that's where I, I get frustrated with people that, you know, come up and talk to me about mics or something. And I'll be like, it just just give me some mics. I'll get it done. You know, it, I'll pick the one that works for that thing in the moment. That's when I'm good. I'm not good discussing this stuff. It's all ephemera. It's like, eh, it changes. It's always different. But it's like, you know, I think if you when you study this and you work at it hard enough for years, you can put things up and go, oh, oh, oh no, no, not that. You know, change that. You know, that's not right. That's not going to fit. You know, and you, you start to learn how to produce and how to put a, a record together that sounds cohesive and exciting. And it's just, it just takes years. <laughs> and I've worked with artists like Elliot, it would be a great example. In his 30s, could just 
Yeah. Go in and play all the tracks by himself to a click, and it all came well, yeah. together like a band, you know? And it's amazing. Larry, it was amazing. Yeah. And I've got to figure out how we can do this more often. Definitely. We definitely. Sh- we, should, awesome. we should, we should, we should, I don't know. We'll figure out something. This is fun because I, I, <laughs> I know we could go off on a tangent and talk for hours. This is amazing. Probably. <laughs> Thank you ever so much. Thanks everybody right. for watching. Please go make sure you're on tape. You get tape up. It's 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 the best out there. It's fantastic, and it's it really does. Uh, is this a lace up? There it is. Is that the latest one? Yeah, it is. Oh my God, it was on my floor with a big mess. <laughs> Woo, there it goes. <laughs> Thanks. I really appreciate your time. Please, as everybody, subscribe. Go to producelikeapro.com. Sign up for email list. Leave loads of questions and comments below. Maybe we can get Larry to engage. <laughs>